so um, I'm back. Uh, let's start, start lecturing again. Um, so just, again, a uh, quick overview of what's coming up for this due for you guys. Uh, homework number four we do um, uh, this Wednesday. The midterm exam will be in class here uh, a week uh, from now, on, on, on Wednesday, the October 18th. Uh, I, will, I will discuss what the midterm will look like and hand out a practice exam on, uh, on Wednesday in, in the next class. And it will cover everything up to and including what we'll talk about on Wednesday. So for, for next week's lecture, starting on Monday, that won't be included on the exam at all. And then project number two is due Wednesday, October 25th, after the exam. So if you sort of look at the assignment schedule for the course, there are six homeworks, but four of them come before the midterm. That was done on purpose because the want the focus to be on the projects after the midterm. So we're sort of front-loading a bunch of these sort of basic things, the, the, the introduction stuff that you need to understand to sort of get started on the database system, and then we'll focus more on programming after the, uh, in the second half of the, of the semester. So any questions about any of these things? Yes? His question is, are you allowed to bring a cheat seat for the exam? Yes, you have one sheet, handwritten only. Uh, you can put anything you want. Any other questions? All right. Uh, Single-sided. <laughs> eight and a half by 11. All right, double-sided, eight and a half by 11. That should be enough. That's fine, yes, that's fine. OK. Uh, so the other thing I want to real quickly talk about was there was sort of a major announcement in databases last week. Did anybody see it? Does anybody know what it was? It was on Hacker News. It was on Reddit. It was on everywhere on Twitter. Nobody? Uh, Postgres came out with version 10. Uh, version 9 has been around for a while. Version 10 is, is a, a pretty significant improvement. So I'm not going to really talk about uh, what's new in it. The one thing that I think is most noticeable or notable is that they're adding better support for parallel query execution, which is what we will talk about on, on Monday next week. Um, the reason why this has sort of always been an issue in Postgres is because the way the system is, is architected comes from a time when threads weren't as, as sort of a viable option for parallel execution as they are now. Right, Postgres was designed in the late 1980s, early 1990s, before we had POSIX threads. And so the way they would have multiple, multiple uh, parallelism in the system was they would fork off a process for every single new connection. But within, that, within a single process, it would only be able to execute a query with a single thread. So now what they're adding in the newer versions of Postgres is that you can have the different processes work on behalf of the same query rather than having one, one process be dedicated to the entire uh, query. MySQL still can't do parallel execution as far as I know, at least in version 5. I don't know what's coming in version 8. Um, but this isn't an issue in any of the major commercial systems. Right? And any new system built now, for the most part, can, can do parallel query execution. But in my opinion, this is the most significant thing in the latest version of Postgres. So, all right, so last week, when, uh, when Joy taught, uh, he spent time talking about external merge sort. I guess was the, as he talked about, this is a way to sort some table or relation or intermediate result as you execute a query and not require that that, that entire data set fit entirely in, in DRAM. Because right? everything fits in memory, everything fits in your buffer pool, then you just run quick sort, right? as you learned in an intro class. But if you need to spill a disk, then you want to be a bit smart about how you do that, and that's what external, external more sort does. And then he then built upon that and started talking about different join algorithms. He talked about nested loop join, which is the most basic thing. It's just two four loops nested in each other, and you just iterate over each, each the outer relation and the inner relation. And then he talked about sort merge join, right, which basically <coughs> building off of, of the external merge sort technique. So in general, uh, there are essentially three major classes of join algorithms. So the nested loop is one, the sort merge is the other, and the one that we're going to focus on today are hashing-based algorithms. Um, and the spoiler would be that in, this, in, in most cases, the hash join is always going to be the preferred option. 
right? There's some cases where the sort merge is better, some cases where using actually a nested loop join is better. Um, but in general, you always, in, in practice, you, the systems always try to make the hash join work, work the fastest because that's where most of the time is going to be spent, right? When you actually, when you look at profiles of where the CPU time or, or the computation time is spent for queries, a large majority of it is always going to be in the, in the, in the hash join. And this will be a bigger issue when we talk about in-memory databases in the advanced class in the spring, because now you're not worried about getting page faults or swapping things in from, from disk into your buffer pool. Everything's always in memory. So getting your hash join to work as fast as possible is, is, is a huge, huge, uh, is, is a big win. So the, in the book and in, 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 the, in general in lectures, when people talk about join algorithms, they always sort of describe it in terms of, at a high level, that like, oh, you join these two tables together and, and there's some output and it goes to the next operator. But I think it's actually worth time spending, talk about, spending some time to talk about what the output actually looks like. Because I looked at the textbook and I've seen other textbooks, they don't really talk about this. Um, but it is actually a big deal when you actually implement, implement a join algorithm in a real system. So the output of a join operator is going to essentially be, at a, at a logical level, the concatenation of the outer, the tuple from the outer relation and a tuple from the inner relation. Um, and it's sort of, you know, in, in an abstract term, you, know, you just define it as, in this case here, you have a tuple R, tuple S, it's the join of those two guys together. But in practice, in, in reality, when you actually build this, the contents of what the output actually is, what that, those, two, those concatenated tuples look like, can, can depend greatly based on the implementation of your database system. So it can depend on things like the, the query processing model that we talked about in lecture 10. Right? Are you pushing single tuples? Are you pushing the entire output in, in, the, in the materialization processing model? Are you pushing a vector of tuples? Um, it can depend on how you actually store your tuples. Right? Again, this is in terms of whether it's a row store or it's a column store. And it can also depend on, on the query. Maybe your query doesn't need all the columns or all the attributes to be shoved up to the next operator. And so maybe you don't want to store a bunch of extra stuff in your, in, in, in your hash table when you combine things together. Maybe you only pass along just the things that you need. It's sort of like pushing a pro uh, projection down inside of the join operator. So I want to talk basically about two approaches you can do this. Um, and this will come up later when we talk about, uh, when we talk about the hash join algorithm when we talk about what we're actually going to put in our hash tables to do our, to do our joins. So the, the most obvious or simplest thing to do, and this is what, how people most, most people think about uh, join algorithms, is that the, the output would just be a straight copy of exactly all the attributes from the outer relation and all the attributes from the inner relation. Right? So let's say that we're doing this simple join query here on, on table A and B. And table A has two columns, ID and name. Table B has three columns, ID, value, and creation date, or C date. So if we just join them together, then we're just going to have a concatenation of, all, of the two attributes from the, from the outer relation and the three attributes from the inner relation. And that just creates a single tuple. And of course, as you see here, like I'm doing a, an a equi join, or I have an equality predicate where A.ID equals B.ID. And I could be smart about it and say, well, I don't really need to store AD, ID twice for, for the outer and, and inner relation, but I do that anyway because it's just, I don't know, it's less bookkeeping to figure out where, where actually things are. So the way to throw it, typically this, this tuple is essentially what the output of this join operator will be, then up to the projection. And then the projection operator, you know how to say, well, I'm taking the A ID, I'll jump to that offset, and then I'll, I'll take C date, and I jump to that offset, and I just grab those values out and concatenate them together, and that's the final output of the query. So the advantage of this is that the subsequent operators in the query plan never have to go back to the base table to get any additional information to actually compute the answer that, that they need. Right? The, the input to the projection operator has everything that it needs to actually then do the projection. And in the query planner, the thing actually takes the SQL and generates the, 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 the query plan tree. It'll bake into the operator information about where the offsets are that, that, that it needs for these attributes. So it'll know that, all right, I'm doing projection, and I expect my input to look like 
uh, have five attributes. I need to jump to the first one and the last one to get the two attributes that, that I need. That's all to sort of be baked in ahead of time in, in the query plan, so you're not figuring out on the, on the fly. So again, the advantage of this approach is that you don't have to go get more information. But what's the downside of this? It should be obvious, right? Correct. It takes more space and memory, right? So in this case here, I'm passing along the, the name, uh, and I'm actually passing along the value, even though I don't need these attributes ever again in the query plan. Again, the projection will do this for me, uh, but it'd be nice not to have to copy this for every single tuple that matches. We won't talk about this in this lecture. We'll talk about more about this in next class. But one of the things the database system can do is estimate what the selectivity will be for your join operator, operators, right? In this case here, it was an equi join, and it's a real simple, simple, uh, simple example. So there was two matches. But imagine you're joining really large tables. You know, it may be 100% of the tuples of the two tables will match, or maybe only less than 1% match. And so based on what the selectivity is, how many tuples you expect to come out of, of your join operator, you may want to choose one approach versus, versus the, another. Or you may want to push down a projection to be much earlier in the query plan so you strip these things out ahead of time. So the alternative is to just pass around record IDs. So say we, again, we have our two tables before, we do our join, and now the only thing we're going to include are the, uh, the IDs from the two attributes, two, sorry, the two relations, could we join them together. But then also now we just have the record IDs. So the way to sort of think about this is that when we're going up the query plan here, we're only we're passing along the record IDs of, of the tuples that we're looking at. And I mean, in this case here, because we're doing the join on, on, AI, on the ID value, uh, we'd have to go to disk go, or go out to go get them for this column and then put them into the form you need to actually then do the join. Right, so in this case here, the output of the projection just has these four attributes. And again, two of them are the internal uh, record IDs that the system uses to say, here's the offset, or here's the page in the offset to go find the thing, the thing that I need. All right, so what's the problem with, with this example? Correct, yeah, so I, so I, I need C date for, for the, the, the inner relation to compute my projection, so then I gotta go back to the base table and actually go get it. So now, this is where the selectivity stuff comes up, comes up again, because if my selectivity is really low, meaning like I'm only gonna generate two tuples out of a billion that, that match one of my join, then going get that C date is, is not a big deal. Right? I'm only maybe going have to go fetch two things. Um, so the advantage of this is that this is, this is really great for a column store to only pass around record IDs because the, each operator will only go get the thing that it actually needs when it needs it. And this is sometimes called late, late materialization, right? Materialization would be taking the record ID and generating the exact tuple on, on all its contents. And so in, with late materialization, I can wait to the very end to the projection operator and then go fetch the, the, the creation date. And then you sort of essentially putting the tuple back together. So in a column store, this is great because if there's a bunch of columns that I don't read to compute my query, then I never go, I never have to go get them. I, I don't waste, I don't waste, you know, d disk IO getting them, and I don't waste memory putting them into my buffer pool, even though I'm never actually going to need, need them again. So this is what I was sort of saying that what the ideal approach to use, whether you pass around the record IDs or actually just make copies of the data, depends on all these different factors. Right? If it's a column store, then using record IDs could, could be a big win. If it's a row store, then it doesn't really help because you're going to go fetch those, those attributes anyway and bring them to the buffer pool where everything's always contiguous. Uh, in this case here, the query needed the, uh, the, the customer date, but if you needed all the attributes, then passing around the data from operator to operator is probably the better approach versus passing record IDs. So again, this will come up in a few more slides when we talk about what we're actually going to put in our hash table to do our joins, um, because we, we'll talk about in terms of what data we need to store in our hash table to actually be able to compute the join, but this sort of affects after that 
based on what you had in that hash table to determine what data you need to retrieve or what data you can throw away as you shove up the result of the join to the next operator. OK? So the today's agenda, we're going to talk about uh, basically two categories of, of things. And this, this is sort of the last lecture we'll need for defining how we actually do query execution. Right, we started off before talking about how we do access, run the access methods to actually read the data that are in the underlying tables to get the tuples out. And then Joy talked about how to do sorting. We talked about how to do uh, the basic join algorithms. So the last two major things that we need to talk about are the hash join algorithms, because as I said, they're the most important join algorithm. And then we'll talk about how to use hashing again to do aggregations. And this is basically all you really need to, to implement basic SQL in a database system. Other things like limits, uh, havings, those are all sort of trivial to do in some ways, right? Everything we're doing here is sort of the complex things, and we can use these as building blocks to do more complicated queries. And I'll, I'll show some examples uh, at the end in a demo with, with Postgres. Okay, so for hash join, the, the basic idea way to think about it is that or the, the intuition of how the hash join is going to work is that you're going to have a tuple from your outer relation R and a tuple from your inner relation S. And the, if they're going to satisfy the join condition, right, does something equal something, then the, you know, the values will have to be the same on those join attributes. For now, we can, we can, we can ignore anti-join because that's the negation of that. But for this, it's, it's, you know, does something equal something? They have to have, you know, in order to match that join predicate, you have to have the same values. So now, because they'll have the same values for the join attributes, then if we hash that value, the first value in the, 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 the outer relations tuple, and then hash that same value in the inner relations tuple, they're going to have to match the same hash value. They're going to have to hash to the same key. See, so the idea here is that we're going to hash all the join attributes on the outer relation and all the join attributes in the inner relation, and they should end up be hashing to the same location in our hash table. And then that means that we only need to actually just do a comparison on the join predicates for the tuples that hash to the sort of same bucket or the same location. That's the, same, the basic idea. You're using hashing as a way to, to sort of split up the workload in a way so that you're not comparing with something that you know can never possibly even match our key. You're only looking at things that you th think could match. So hash join has two phases. So in the f first phase called, is called a b the build phase. It's where you just do a scan on the outer relation and for every single tuple, you're going to use some hash function to hash its join attributes and populate a hash table. And for our purposes right in this class, we don't care what our hash table implementation is. We can use any of the things that we, we talked about before, right? The open, open hashing, the chain hashing, all the dynamic hash tables, cuckoo hashing. It doesn't matter what, what, what hash table we use. Uh, the, the basic algorithm will, will work the same. I can maybe talk a little bit of this at the end, but there are some trade-offs for uh, what, what implementation might be better than another. Uh, typically, in hash joins, you maybe want to use a fixed size hash table because it's much faster to do the lookup. But of course, this, ha this is a problem. If you underestimate the size of your ha you know, that you need, then maybe you've got, you got to rebuild things or you have those, those long chains that, that are slow. But for our purposes here, we don't care. All right, so once you've done the build phase, now you have a hash table of all the tuples in your outer relation. So then now in the probe phase, what you're going to do is do a scan on the inner relation from beginning to end. And for each tuple, you're going to hash it using the same hash function. And then you're going to land into some bucket in the hash table. And then you just do a scan to, to see whether you have a, a match from, from the other tuple. All right, that, that's the basic idea. So visually, it looks like this. Again, so the, in the first phase, the build phase, we're going to pick a hash function and then populate our hash table for the outer relation. Then in the probe phase, we'll look at every single tuple, use that same hash function, we'll jump to some location in the hash table, and then we do a comparison between the, the key that's contained in the bucket. And if we have a match, then we know that you know, they're satisfying our join predicate, 
and we can go ahead and, and, and emit it to our output. So any, any questions about this? this, this yes? His question is, his question is, hashing is only done on the join attributes. So what else would you want to hash on? Right? right? The, the join attribute, by hashing on that, that's sort of giving you, that's sort of, the system is using that as the direction to say, where do I jump at my hash table? So if I join, if I do start hashing on crap that's not part of the join key, uh, and I now come to the other side on the, on the probe phase, and I do the same thing. Well, first of all, it might not even have those, those, those attributes, so it can't hash those. But they're not part of the join predicate, so why would you want to hash on that anyway? Right? Again, we said this before about our hash function, that the hash function has to be that for, for the exact same value, it always produces the same hash key. So if you have the exact same value for, for on the right side and the left side, then it should point to the same location. And then you just have to figure out whether you, you find an exact match in, in, your, in your bucket. Yes? Right, so his question is, his, his statement is, um, uh, this doesn't work for all cases, because in the first example you said, if, if you're doing a join on a range predicate, then absolutely right, your hash, uh, it, it doesn't help you because, you know, this hashing only works for equality predicates. And then your second statement was, if I'm doing a join on an attribute that has a, a, a really low cardinality, like sex, Right? For simplicity's sake, it's just male and female. So you have two, two possible values. Then you're right. You're going to have two buckets that have really long chains, and then you're essentially doing a, a nested loop join inside the bucket. Right? Yeah, so that's, a, that's maybe the, po the point that I'm missing here is when you do a hash now on the, on the probe side, you land to a bucket. We'll talk about what, the, what these buckets look like, but you're essentially doing a, now a nested loop join or doing, doing a sequential scan inside the bucket to do comparisons for all the tuples from the, the outer relation that are inside that bucket to see whether you have a match. So if your cardinality on the outer table is, is really crappy, meaning you only have two values, then you're essentially doing a, uh, a, a worst case nested for loop, a nested, uh, nested, nested loop join which is always the worst join to do. OK. So the key for the hash table, as I said, is always the attributes that you're trying to do the join on. And for simplicity, assume that we're always going to do a, uh, an equality join. But now the value that's going to be inside the join will vary on the implementation. And it varies based on the things we talked about before, where the other operators make some assumption or have to know what the input to them is going to be. So in order to, to produce the output in the form that other operators in the query plan need, we ha may have to store some additional information inside of our, inside of our, so the value portion of our hash table. So there's two approaches. So the first is that uh, the value is going to contain the entire tuple or you know, the, the subset of the columns that are needed for the tuples in the outer relation. Right? So you're always going to have to have the join attributes stored in the value because the hashing may end up, you may end up with collisions. So two keys that are distinct may end up hashing to the same bucket. So when now you do, when you land inside the bucket and you do that scan to see whether you have a match, you need a way to actually compare the actual real keys. So you always have to have the keys. Now the question is, do you want to store the additional attributes you may need up in the rest of the, of the, of the query plan? And again, it depends on what, what, you, uh, what the operator up in the query plan expects to have. And of course, the downside of this now is you're essentially making a second copy of the tuple and storing it in memory because you have to store it in your hash table. And again, you can be smart about certain things, maybe push down the projections so that you only store attributes in the, in the hash table that you may need later on in the query plan. Um, but the simplest thing to do is, is just make a uh, complete copy. And then the alternative is that, again, you can use the tuple identifier, which is, again, ideal for column stores because you don't actually need to fetch any additional data that you need. Now, the tricky thing about this is that 
there may be some, uh, there's some times where the, 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 the query planner could say, I have, I'm doing a join on two attributes, but because of some selectivity or how I'm, I'm storing the data, maybe I only want to do the ha build a hash table on the first attribute, and then I'll do, an, do a sort of a, a straight full comparison of the attributes inside of the, when I do, I do the sequential scan. Um, so in that case, again, you, you, you will have to copy some extra things along with your tuple identifier. Um, but the main thing to point out here is, again, it, it, it's all the things that I talked about before. What the query operator expects, the operator expects you ab above you in the query plan will determine which one of these you want to use. And there's trade-offs for each of these. The first one uses more memory. The second one requires more disk reads if, 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 you, if you have to go get additional information. So now, the join algorithm that I showed you just now, that assumes your hash table fits entirely in main memory, right? So it's kind of obvious, it's kind of easy. So in the same way that we had in the sorting algorithms from last class, if everything's in memory, you just use quick sort. If it's not, you have to then spill to disk. So now we've got to deal with the situation where our hash table doesn't fit in main, main memory, and how we actually want to compute the join in such a way that is, is really efficient. So the, the dumbest thing to do is just let the buffer pool manager inside of our system swap out pages whenever it wants. Right. You know, in terms of the hash table pages. So we do a sequential scan on the outer relation. We populate our hash table. Now we start doing a sequential scan on the, the, the inner relation. But now the buffer pool manager has swapped out a bunch of pages. And as we go along, we, we, we do a lookup. Why, why is this a bad idea? Or why is this sort of the worst case scenario? What is it about the access patterns of hashing that is detrimental to, to, to this. His statement is all the buckets are in the same page. But he, so like all the values in the bucket are going to be in the same place. All the values in the bucket are being the same. Yeah, so, so typically the bucket is the same size as the page. Yes. So, yeah, so the locality is the big issue here, right? It's good. Hashing takes a value um, and sort of jumps, can jump randomly anywhere inside your hash table. Now, if, you're, if, you're, if you're, your tables are very skewed, which is often the case in, in real workloads, then it may be the case that all the, all the, t the attributes you're trying to join on will be the same, so they're always going to hash to the same bucket. But in practice, that usually it's usually not the case. So if the buffer pool manager starts swapping out our pages in our hash table, you know, and, and willy-nilly, then in the worst case scenario for every single tuple that we have to look at in the, in the inner relation as we scan through, that's always going to be a cache miss, and it's always going to have to go get the disk, go out the disk to get it, right? And so, we, so by, what we want to do is be more careful about this and try to maximize the, or maximize the reuse of pages when we fetch them in memory when we do our hash join. So to do this, the technique or the algorithm is called the Grace hash join. So probably no one here has heard of the, the, the Grace database system. It was, a, uh, it was a database machine that was developed in Japan in the 1980s. And the Grace hash join is, they have a paper that, that proposes how to do hash joins when your, your, your tables don't fit in memory. Um, and this is the technique that they use. And this is actually the picture that's from the, the University of Tokyo website that shows the, what, the, uh, what the actual Grace database machine looks like. Who here has actually ever heard of the term database machine? No, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't surprise me because, again, this was a big term in the 1980s. Uh, people, don't, people don't use it now. Who here has heard the term database appliance? No one. OK. So uh, a, a database appliance uh, is sort of like it's, if you have a, if you're, say, a database system vendor, you can sell people machines, like you know, rack units, that are you know, tuned and tailored to be running their particular database system. 
So the idea is to set a buying machine from Dell or HP or whatever, and then loading your own OS and then loading the database system and setting it up all yourself. You can buy a machine that comes pre-configured and that's set up to already run their, your you know, particular database system. So the most famous database appliance vendor is Oracle. Uh, Oracle has a bunch of database appliances. The most expensive one is this thing over here called Exadata. I, I mean, I don't know exact numbers, I think, but it starts in the millions, right, to, to buy one of these things. They were super expensive. Clusterix was a uh, new SQL startup out of San Francisco. Then they, for a while, they sold a database appliance. And then the one in the back is IBM Natiza. Uh, and again, you sort of you buy this, this this whole rack that has you know sort of standard Xeon processors, but they're again it's it's set up and tuned in such a way that that's that's ideal for the database system. So uh, I would say that we we won't talk about hardware so much in this class. We talk more about it later on. But the except for the major vendors, it's super hard to break into like the appliance business, right? Oracle, you know, there's a lot of people that have a lot of money that run Oracle, so the Exadata sells really well for them. The Clusterix guys, they eventually decided that uh, the appliance business, they weren't making any money, so they got rid of that, and now they, just sell, they sort of sell software. Um, the way to sort of think about this is that if you're building a new database system from a business side, it's always best to, to target commodity hardware. Meaning if you can't run on Amazon, you can't run your database system on, on Amazon EC2, then people are, are not likely to adopt it because they don't want to get locked into like some appliance that you're going to sell them, and then you, the company goes bankrupt and you're screwed because you have unsupported hardware. Right? At, Oracle can do this because it's Oracle. Or IBM can do it because you know, those are big, big companies. So uh, a, now a database machine would be actually a system that has specialized hardware to run a database system. So the appliance is sort of off the shelf hardware. It's just sort of set up to run a database system. A database machine is where they add proprietary stuff to, to make the data system run faster. And again, that's even, that's even harder to sell because again, you're selling exotic hardware that people aren't gonna trust or aren't gonna want, want to support. Um, and as often the case, maybe it's not so much now, but in the 1980s, part of the reason why the data, database machines never really took off was uh, by the time you got something to market, right, for your specialized hardware, the, the you know, Morse Law or all the, other, all the other advancements for commodity hardware caught up to the point where you no longer had a big advantage. So people don't really build data machines anymore, although you are seeing some, some new stuff starting to come out uh, in the last like uh, one or two years. So there might be a resurgence of this because the Xeons aren't getting, you know, sort of Xeon is sort of plateauing with, with you know, the, the, the benefits you can get out of this. But anyway, so, so when we say Grace hash join, just so you know, it comes from this, this very famous project from the 1980s. Uh, it's not named after a, a person. Okay, so again, the, the this, this particular hash join algorithm we're going to talk about, again, is going to allow us to do a join when we don't have uh, enough memory to store our hash table, or even, uh, both tables at the same time. So again, basically what's going to happen is, the basic way to think about this is that we're going to build a hash table on, uh, on both sides, both the outer relation and the inner relation, and then we're going to do just our, our comparison on just buckets that are at the same level. Right? So, Again, for the first step we'll do is we'll build our hash table for, uh, for R and the outer relation, and then we'll do the same thing using the same hash function for the inner relation. And now the way to sort of think about this is at every single level at, in, in our hash table, we know that the values from the first hash table and the second hash table have to match or have to ha have been hashed to the same key. So now when we want to do our uh, our comparison, the only thing we need to do now is just examine each, each, the buckets at each level by themselves. So for, for, for bucket, you know, level zero, on either side, I never need to look at any of the, uh, any of the other buckets at the other lower levels, because I know they're going to hash to the same thing. And then the reason why we want to do this is because we, say we only have, you know, two pages in our, in our database system, where we can only bring in you know, two buckets at a time, that's enough for us to do our join. So all these can be swapped out to disk, and then now when I do my scan through the different levels and do, the, do our sort of comparison between the two, and two different buckets, I just go fetch the, one, the first page from the outer relation, the first page from the, from the inner relation, bring those in memory, and now I do a basic nested, nested loop join. 
And we said nested loop joins are bad, but this for this it's fine because the buckets aren't going to be really really big, right? Because they, they have to be you know, they have to fit within you know page, page size, um, and every, so everything's in memory. So we're not worried about you know uh, going back to disk over and over again. So typically, I think most database systems will implement this anyway, um, even if you don't have a limited amount of memory. And particularly in the in-memory systems, they do something very similar to this, where everyone, they, everyone basically tries to do uh, a hash join. So what's one problem with this? What's, what's one thing we have to overcome? The so statement is you're assuming double memory. No, because again, in this case here, all the lower, lower levels can be swapped out. That's not an issue. I, I, only, need, I need to only have those two pages. Uh, what do you mean with a lot more pages? I mean, like, in terms of number of levels? Because, like, the buckets, like, won't be full. Where, originally, each page in your, like, database storage, you would be, like, you know, pretty happy with the pages. Oh, so I think, so I think what he's saying is uh, there could be potentially wasted storage because every bucket won't be full. Uh, and so when you go fetch something from disk, you're essentially fe fetching wasted space. Well, yeah, you can't, like, or fetching empty space. Um, so, so, so your statement is, so the, when they find a match, they skip what? Yeah. And then you can hash them all through their own pages. That's like, like 10 times. It, see, it's, all right, so, so, yeah, so his statement is, if I have 10 tuples, and they could all fit in a single page when they were stored in the table heap, but then when I do my hash join, uh, now they get split up across 10 pages, so now I'm fetching 10 pages for what I could have done as a single page. Yeah. Right. Uh, again, the database system will know the size of the tables. It'll know the selectivity, and it'll say, oh, I have 10 tuples. We can try this in Postgres. Let me just do a let me just do a nested loop because that's that's good enough, right? Um, it's it's actually related to running out of memory. So, but it's actually sort of related to what you're saying. So, in this, in, in all these examples, we're assuming uniform distribution. So, we're going to assume that the every page will be roughly have the same number of tuples. But again, in in in, in real world databases, uh, you see skew distributions all the time. So, it may be the case that this, this first page in level zero, it has way too many tuples, right? And so then we have all these, these, these overflow change, chains, and now it becomes problematic because now my, since I'm doing a nested for loop, all the same terrible things we talked about last class where you have no lo locality as you're doing a scan, even, even if you're doing the block nested, nested loop, uh, you, you're, you're, you're hitting this problem. So if everything has to the first level, then you're basically back where, you, where, where we were before with a nested loop join and getting terrible performance. So what we can do is if our, if our buckets don't fit in memory at a particular level, then we can do what's called recursive partitioning, where we can keep splitting the, the, over, the oversized buckets into subsequent sort of mini hash tables or internal hash tables, and then we know how to then go back the other direction when we want to do a probe and jump to the right, right bucket that, that we need. So let's, let's, this is probably easier to understand through an example. All right, so let's say that we do, uh, we're on the build, the build phase of our, of our hash join. So we run the first hash function, and we get a bunch of these buckets. And what we see at level zero, it has a bunch of, a bunch of more extra pages, because everything's hashing to that, that same location. So to do recursive partitioning, what you end up doing is you just pick now a second hash function that's completely different than the first hash function, 
And typically you do this by, by adding a, a salt value to, to, to the input of the, of, the, of the hash. And then now I'll split that, uh, what used to be level one, I'll split it into three, three different buckets. And I, I, I can do this you know, as many times as I want. If everything keep, keeps hashing to the, the same bucket or I have my buckets are too, are too full, I can keep recursively going on and splitting it further and further. Yes? So this will help if you have kind of regular collisions, but it won't help if your keys are non-unique, right? Because they'll hash to the same value regardless of the hash. All right, so his statement is, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So his statement is, this only helps you if the keys are unique. Uh, if they're not unique, then regardless of what hash function you use, they're always going to hash to the same value. That is correct, yes. Uh, no, but, he, but the salting is, if you salt the same value, the salt is assigned to the hash function. So if you salt the same key, multiple times but using the same same salt value, it's always going to hash to the same result. Yeah, but I can salt the... Hmm. Well, I could salt the result and then hash to the same value. Yeah, you can't, you, then you can't go the other direction. Right. So again, so this works for unique keys. It doesn't work for, for non-unique keys. OK. So now... The way to sort of think about it on the, on the, again, on the, on the build size, our hash table is, is these, these five buckets. And then the inner ones were generated with the second hash function, and then the first and the last were generated with the, the first hash function. So now when I want to do my probe, uh, the, if I, I always run the, the first hash function, and then I keep track of I know what ranges of levels I need to then apply the second hash function. So if I go to level zero, that's fine to go to level, level, the last level, that's fine. But if I go to hash to level one, then I know that this thing was split on the build side, so I want to run the second hash function, and then it'll tell me exactly where I, I really want to go. Yes? So the statement is, you have to maintain some additional internal data structure for the metadata to know about this. That's correct, yes. But that's trivial, right? Like. It's, it's, you know, it's for, for every level, here's the, here's the, or, you know, bucket, here's, here's the hash function I should use, or how deep am I in my recursion? That's, that's nothing. Okay. So now we can talk about what, what the cost of running a hash join is. So, assume we have enough buffers. The cost of doing the grace hash join is always uh, three times n plus one, n plus n. And what, why is it three times n plus n? So, so the first phase, in the partitioning or the, or the build phase, right, you always have to read every single table, right? So, you, so the outer relation is, is m, the inner relation is n. Then you have to build the hash table, and again, assuming that we're going to write the entire values back into the hash table, then, and, you know, assuming that we have also you know, uniformly distributed pages, everything you know, is not highly skewed, then you always, you always have to write them back out, so that's another n plus n. Then on the, the probe phase, we need to read back in every page on the outer relation and the inner relation one by one, and then do the nest, nested loop join between the, two that, between the two at each level. So the... Joy was showing a running example of, of two tables last class to show you sort of real-time cost, cost calculations. So we say the outer relation has m pages, and then the inner relation has or, m, the outer relation has m pages, which is the thousand. The inner relation has n pages, which is five hundred. Then we can compute the hash join for these for these two two tables in forty five hundred IO, IOs. Which, if you're using an SSD that has a uh, 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 one tenth of a millisecond per I/O operation, we can compute this in 45 seconds. And I think when we looked at the other other ones, it was um, in the worst case the nest loop was like you know 500 500 seconds. So again, in general, the hash the hash joins always going to be the fastest approach. 
because you only have to read and write the tables th three times. Okay, so the, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but we said that the, um, I think that math's wrong. That should be 0 0.45 seconds, sorry. We'll fix that later. Okay, the, uh, as I said before, the, the, if the database system is going to try to estimate the, the number of tuples it's going to have on both the, the, the outer relation and the inner relation, and as well as the number of tuples it expects to be admitted based on the selectivity of the join predicate. Um, and so based on this estimation, it'll select a hash table size uh, that, that, that will, uh, will have enough space. Um, and we'll see next class why this is problematic. And this is actually one of the notorious problems you have in a query optimizer of trying to get these selectivities correct. Right? It's really easy when you're you know, doing joins on primary keys or foreign keys, when you know exactly the cardinality, um, and you do an equality predicate. But if you then deviate from that, then it gets tricky. And then if you try to join after another join, then things get, get really messed up. Um, so if you know the size and, and, you, and, you th and, you, and you think you're going to be pretty accurate in your prediction, then you just use one of the, the fixed size hash tables that we talked about before. Um, and this is ideal because there's less computational overhead to do the, the building and the probe. Right? As you saw in, in the extendable hash table project, right, you always have to check to see what the, what the, the, uh, the number of bits you're going to be using for the hash at the, at the global level and the local level. Um, and that, that takes time. And then if you don't know the size of your, uh, if, you, if you don't know exactly the size of your hash table, uh, you want to either you use one of the dynamic hashing tables that we talked about before, or you just allow for overflow pages or the overlo overflow chains. Um, and again, it's, it's up to the data system to decide which one of these approaches it wants to use. Typically, though, I would say, at least in the open source guys, uh, Often the case they try to do they try to do the the, the fixed size ones. I think Postgres recently added support to do the dynamic resizing. All right, again, just to summarize, uh, this number is correct. To summarize uh, what we talked about before, when we said you know m equals a thousand and n equals equals five hundred, uh, here's all the join algorithms, and as you can see, the hash join is is always going to be the fastest one. And typically, this is why the the most database systems will, will choose to use this. So can I think of an example where the sort merge join actually might be better? Right, if, you, if, if the output of the query has an, the query has an order by clause, and it's the same thing as what you're trying to join on, then you get sorting for free, so it just does that. Right? And we can, we can look at some examples at, at the end on Postgres. All right, so that's basically it. So, so, as I said, these are basically the three classes of join algorithms that are out there, um, and everything, for the most part, is a, is a, is a variation of, of these. So now we can talk about actually how, how we want to compute ag aggregates. So recall that the aggregation, uh, an aggregation function is just taking, taking one or more tuples and computing, you know, c collapsing them down, computing some function on them that produces a single scalar value, right? Average, min, max, count, sum, uh, and uh, I think that's, that's the, the basic SQL 92 ones. So in the same way that we had this choice between sorting versus hashing for joins, we have the same, same choice when we want to compute aggregations. So let's start with a really simple, simple, the simplest example, um, and let's do a, a, a distinct query. Right? Again, distinct is basically collapsing down multiple values and producing a, a, single, a single, single result. So if you want to do this uh, using a sort, then the basic uh, query, uh, the flow of the query plan is we'll first do the filter based on our where clause, and then we'll do our projection to remove any columns that we don't want, and then we end up doing our sort. Right? And now in this case here, to do the distinct, we see that we know that in, in the order of, of going from the top to the bottom, any values that are the same will be contiguous with each other in the list. So all we have to do is just iterate or scan through our final output, check to see whether the current value of the tuple that I'm looking at is the same as the last one. And if it is, then I know it's not distinct, so I can go ahead and eliminate it. 
I, and this is how I, 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 I can compute my answer. So this is really simple to do. Uh, we don't have to build any, any extra hash tables. And then our sorting it can just be the same external merge sort algorithm that we talked about last class. Um, so now the question is, when you, maybe when you want to use a hashing versus when you want to use sorting. So typically, whenever time you have a group by clause, uh, you always want to use, use ha a hash table for this because it's really simple to say, here's the, the, here's the attribute I want to group by on or the set of attributes I want to group on, hash those, and that jumps me to a location in my, in my hash table, and then I can start you know, calculating the, the various at, uh, aggregation that I need to do. So typically, the hash table, the hashing approach to do aggregations is always going to be a better approach, um, even if it even if it doesn't fit main memory, um, everything sort of works the same. So I'll walk through an example now how you do uh, uh, aggregation for hashing. Um, and again, it's, it's, as we said, it's, it's basically you know, using the hash table as a way to quickly identify when you have values that are in the same group or have values that are the same. And then if it's distinct, you throw it away. If it's a group by, then you, you compute some running, running calculation. So uh, we'll walk through a uh, simple example. And, but it's basically like the, like the hash join. There's two phases. The first is you do partitioning. And this is essentially where you're, you're, you're splitting up the tuples based on some hash function. And then you know how to spill them out the disk if, if need be. And then you can go fetch them in one by one. Uh, once they're already sort of set up, and then you compute the aggregation that, that you want. For this, we'll assume that we have uh, B buffers or B pages in our buffer pool that we can use to write out, write, out, write out data. So if we go back to our distinct query that we showed before, we do our basic filter that we had, uh, we remove any columns, and then now we run some hash function and we'll write out these keys to the, uh, to the different partitions. And then if we see that we have a, uh, in this case here we're doing distinct, so we could easily just check to see whether we already have a match. But if you're doing some other uh, calculation, you want to basically fill these, these, fill these partitions with all the data that it needs. And then in the second phase, you go back in, read them in, and do an additional hashing on them. Then to put it into another hash table, to then compute the aggregation that you, that you want. So you're essentially doing two passes over the data. You're computing two, two separate hash, hash tables. Um, but the idea is that in order to compute the aggregation, you need to know what all the data it is for that particular group. So you put it all into the same bucket, and then you can actually compute the thing that you want. So if you go back now in, in the second phase, so here's all the buckets we have in the first pass. Then we run a second hash function. That populates a hash table. Uh, in this case here, uh, we would see there should be another 15.445 here. But you would see 15.445 twice, or see that it already exists in the hash table when you, when you populated it, so then you, you would just ignore it. And then the final output of your query is just all the value portions of the hash table. So how big a table can you do with this? Um, so if you have b minus 1 spill partitions, then your table can be exactly uh, b times b minus 1. Right, because the first you're going to go through and have n blocks, um, and this, you take the square root of, of the number of blocks that you have, and I'll determine roughly on the number of, of buckets you're going to need, um, assuming you have uniform distribution. But if you don't have uniform distribution, then typically what you do is have a fudge factor where you maybe pre-allocate some extra blocks ahead of time, so that you don't end up having too too large an overflow chain, and you don't have to write out the disk more than you actually need. So I'm going through this very quickly, but it's 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 pretty straightforward, and the focus is really on uh, just the idea of using hashing in, a, in another scenario to compute aggregations. So uh, again, if, if you don't fit in memory, then you just use uh, recursive partitioning. Then it works exactly as, as the same as we saw in the join. So what I really want to focus on, again, is this idea of sorting versus hashing. What, what are the trade-offs? So uh, in the Hash, hashing case, if you have n blocks, then you, you can do the hash function exactly in the square root of n. But in the case of sorting, then it's roughly around, around the same, right? It's always going to be about the square root of n. So the hashing versus sorting are roughly the same in terms of, uh, 
of the performance of them, but in, in practice, the hashing is always going to be better. OK. So to finish up real quickly, uh, the because I, I want to get to the demo, right? The as as we sort of said before, the choice of what whether you want to use hashing for sorting for either joins or for for aggregations depends on on a lot of different things. Um, depends on what the query looks like. Depends on what the data looks like. We already talked about in last class how to do a bunch of optimizations for for sorting. All of them are, are still applicable here because then the sorting for the aggregation is just doing external merge sort. And you know that how to scan through complete ag aggregation as you go along. In the case of hashing, we can actually do uh, we can use the hash table to actually calculate our aggregations as we go along, rather than having to build a second hash table and then just do another scan on it to comp compute our, our aggregation. And so this is called hash uh, sort of inline or on online summarization or hashing summarization. Again, the basic idea is that as we populate the second hash table in the rehash phase, the second phase, we'll compute our aggregation. So it basically looks like this. So the value portion of the hash table will be a, a, a pair where we store the group, group by key and our running total value. So anytime we want to insert a new value into our hash table, we find to see whether we have a group, a group by key match, and then we update our running total as, as needed. If we don't see that we have a match, then we just insert a new entry. And again, I think this is best represented through a visualization. Right, say that we're computing our average here on our table. We've already gone through the first phase, and we computed our buckets. And then now in our hash table, again, we have our running total. So now in the value portion, you see that we have the, our group by key, which in this case here is the course ID. And then we have this internal pair that has some extra metadata about the aggregation we're trying to compute. So in this case here, if you're computing the average, then you need to maintain the count of the number of tuples you've seen and then a running total of, of the sum. Because once you know you've scanned everything, you just divide the, the running total or the sum by the count, and that computes, computes, the, uh, computes the average you want. For all these other ones, it's really trivial, right? The count is just you add plus one every single time you have a match. For the min, the max, you check to see whether the value you may be trying to insert is less than or greater than the the highest or lowest value you've seen before, and you just update that. And then sum is just doing an addition as you go along. It's only really average if you have to maintain some extra metadata. So this will come up later on when we talk about distributed queries or parallel execution, because when you want to compute uh, aggregations across multiple machines, you want, in case you're computing an average, you want to send back the same metadata from one node to the next, because it knows how to combine them all together to compute your final aggregation. Right? It's sort of the same idea here, is that we have some sort of uh, pre-computation that we need to compute the average, and at the end, we just do our simple division and we produce our final answer. Okay, the main idea here is that we're trying to uh, use our hash table to maintain the data we need to compute our aggregation without having to just do a second pass to the values at the end. Yes? Are there aggregations Yes, correct. So, so there are. So I'm showing the SQL 92 ones because they work nicely with this, with medians and other things uh, like standard deviation. You you couldn't do this, correct? Yes. Okay. So the the main thing to remember from from this sort of discussion at the end is just that hashing is almost always going to be better than sorting uh, for either joins or aggregations, and most systems will always always use hashing. Sorting is typically better for non-uniform data. Right? Uh, and then uh, sorting will also be really good when, when you have, uh, when the output should be sorted in the same way. And as we'll see next class, it's the optimizer's job to make the decision about which of these types of algorithms it wants to use to ex execute your query. And it does this by relying on the internal metadata it, 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 it collects about your database and what your query is actually trying to do. So we'll see this next class, but the data system is going to maintain internal statistics about the distribution of your data, and then it uses that to help them decide whether it wants to use one versus the other. Okay, so in the remaining time, I want to pop up in Postgres. So for, the, for this example, uh, I'm just going to show you uh, the sort of in actual real-time performance, what the difference will between, between the merge sort 
or the sort merge join, and then the hash join. Oh, you can't see it, sorry. I think if I just dump out of PowerPoint or end slideshow. See that? Good. Okay. Um, so this, I have uh, three tables. So this is data collected from um, from the uh, the San Francisco Bike Exchange. Right? They have that like the city bikes where you uh, can go and pick up a bike and any you know anywhere in the city and, and ride it around. So this is data collected about uh, when someone took a bike from one station and then took it to, to another station, right? So you have the station table and then you have trips of, of wh where they went, right? So it says like, you know, start time from what station to the, to the next and you know, where, who, who, who took it, right? Or what, what bike it was. So, uh, timing. So I have a really simple query here where we will do a join between the, 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 the trips table and the station table where we have the same station ID and we want to find all the trips where the bike ID was less than 200, right? So if I run ex explain analyze, again, explain analyze is, explain will have it dump out the, the query plan without actually running it. If you add explain analyze, it'll run, actually run the query uh, and actually compute the answer, but also shows you the, the query plan and what actually happened when it ran it. So you see here that it tells you that it wants to do a hash join, and it tells you what the condition was that it, that it did the join on, and it tells you internally, here's the outer relation that it picked the, um, picked the station table, and again, it did a sequential scan on it, because it has to populate the hash table. So it just looked at every single tuple in station, populated the hash table. Then it went and did um, a sequential scan on the trip table to do the probe now into the, into the hash table. Right? And it tells you here that it executed the query in uh, 128 milliseconds. So in Postgres, which you could actually you can do, you can tell it to not... Um, you can tell it to not use certain join algorithms. So in this case here, I can say set enable hash join equal false, right? And this tells Postgres the planner, all right, when, when, when the query comes in, don't try to do hash join at all. Pick other join algorithms, right? Because Postgres supports nested joins, nested loop joins, sort merge, and the hash joins. So now if I go back to my same query and I run, I run the, you know, run explain analyze, I see that it used a, it did a sort merge join, right? So it sorted the, uh, the trip table, sorted the, uh, using quick sort, actually for the, for the station table, it used quick sort. For the trip table, it used external merge sort. And it tells you how much, how, many, how much data it had to write out the disk. And then it tells you that it did the merge up above. Right, so I think the hash join was taking, I think, uh, I think 128 mi milliseconds, and then the sort merge here took 200 milliseconds. Right, still, you know, still sub-second query, but you know, the, the, the table is actually not that big, right? The, the, the trip table has only about 60,000 tuples, and then the station table has, I think it looks like 70. So it's, it's not that big. So, the, the execution time was, is, is almost twice what it was in the hash join. So now we can also do the same thing again. Now we can tell Postgres to disable the merge join, the sort merge join. So right, what, what should the join query be here? Nested loop, right? Uh, so let's see here. So we're trying to do a join on the trip station ID and the station station ID. So let's look to see what these tables actually have. So trip has a index on the, the end station and the start station ID, right? Um, and for station, actually, so, so for this, 
the, the trip table does not have an index on the station ID, right? So to have a foreign key, you would have a foreign key index on the parent table because when you insert a new record on the child table, you have to see whether that value exists in the parent table. So you need to index on the parent table. So in this case here, this is saying that trip has a foreign key relationship with, and it references the station table. So the station table has to have a, uh, has to have an index on the station ID. Right? And so in this case here, the station ID is the primary key. So it tells you it has, it has a B tree. So what should the join look like here? We can't do merge join. We can't do hash join. What should be the inner relation? What should be the outer relation? My guess is that the outer relation should be the trip table because you're going to sequentially scan every single tuple, but then you can use the index on the station ID uh, to, to, in the inner, inner relation and that inner for loop, but then do the lookup. I was wrong. Okay. So it did the, no, no, that's right. Sorry. It did nested loop. Here's, here's the sequential scan on the trip table. So that's the outer relation. And then the inner loop is doing the index scan, the index probe into the station table. So look at here, it says the execution time was actually less than the, the sort merge join, right? Because that index probe is really fast. Now, typically uh, in OLTP, OLTP uh, databases, the, the nested index loop is actually us usually going to be the, the, uh, the best choice because you're not scanning the entire table and you're not trying to uh, compute a really large join. It's only getting a, you know, a single tuple per, per tuple on the, on the outer relation. So we know in this case here, there's only going to be one station per, per trip that, they, that that's station ID that it's pointing to. So it's only going to grab one tuple. So it doesn't make sense to build another hash table. Um, or it doesn't make sense to do, do all the sorting and all this extra work when we know we're only going to find a single tuple at a time. So let's now also, in Postgres, you can actually disable what kind of scan you want to do. So we can say set, uh, enable, index scan, equal false. And now go back to the same query. And now this is the worst of the worst, right? Because this is the, the, the sequential scan. So we see we're doing sequential scan on trip, and then we're doing sequential scan on station. And lo and behold, our execution time is, is over half a second. Right? We went from the hash join case of 128 milliseconds to do, to do the query uh, to the, the you know, worst case scenario, 600 nanoseconds or sorry, milliseconds to do the, the, the regular nested loop scan. Because right? I prevented it from being able to do the index lookup to do the join. So again, in practice, the hash join is always going to be the best approach. And uh, in, in some scenarios, the, 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 the nested loop join, or the index nested loop join might, might, might be better. So maybe we do this. So let's say that we want to do a lookup on a single trip, right? So let's just pick a random um, trip, trip ID, which I think is just trip or ID. So select ID from trip order by, this works in MySQL, this might not work in Postgres, random, limit one, nope, did not like that, nope, let's just do order by um, bike ID. Oh, I'm an idiot. Sorry. I'm using buy. There you go. All right, so basically what I'm doing here is um, uh, it'll randomly, it assign a random value to every single tuple and then, then sorts it based on that. So this is, this is a hacky way to jump to a random location to a random tuple. Don't do this because it's actually really slow. All right, so let's go back to our join. And now what we'll do is instead of saying bike ID less than 200, We'll say uh, trip.id 
equals that. Actually, let's kill this. So let's go back and re-enable um, the index scan and everything, everything that I turned off before. So we go true here. True to this. Oh, sorry, thank you. Actually, let's make it easier. Done. So, so here again, now we're doing our lookup on trip ID. We know we have an index for that. And then we have for the station to do that join op operation, we have an index on that. So what, 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 what join algorithm do we think it's going to use here? I right, raise your hand if you say hash join. Raise your hand if you say sort merge join. Raise your hand if you say index nested loop join. Right? So what, why would it pick index nested loop join? What's that? What's that? Yeah, so because of this, I know I'm going to grab a single tuple. Um, oh, still did a hash join. <laughs> so look at that. So, so it did, uh, yeah, so, so here we do our lookup on trip. We get back a single tuple. And then it still built the hash table because it did a special scan on station. Hmm. Oh, because you know, because so again, this is another example where the optimizer may not do what, what is actually we think is the right thing to do. Uh, it's probably because there's there's seventy tuples in in station, therefore it 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 just said, oh, that's so small. I'll just make that be the odd relation. So let's do this. So let's now let's actually look at the value of this tuple. Um, oh, Windows, how do I go home? No. There we go. How are we doing on time? All right, five minutes. Right. So this is hard to see, but let me, yeah, let's just do this. So that is getting station city. Let's just get the station ID. Awesome. This keyboard is like, it's like really uncomfortable. I shouldn't complain because they, they gave it to me. All right, so station ID 70. So now we'll go back to our query and we'll add another predicate. And station dot station ID equals 70. All right, raise your hand if you think hash join. Raise your hand if you think sort merge join. Index join. All right, nobody, nobody's real confident about this. All right. Oh, sorry, explain, analyze. That's the loop, index scan, right? So in this case here, it saw that it had one tuple in the inner relation, one tuple in the outer relation, and it picked the nested loop join. Right? So. We could try to do. We could just write a program that deletes tuples from the station table, right, one by one, and keep running, explain, analyze, and see what the threshold is inside of Postgres, where it says, "All right, I, I think you have one tuple. Uh, I think you have you have enough tuples. Let me go do the index scan, right?" So I actually I think this is this is this is a good stopping point, and I think this again highlights the thing that we'll talk about next week is just because you know. We think the optimizer is going to do something a certain way. We think of the right plan it's going to be. The, the, the optimizer is sort of this, this black box, this magical beast that can generate query plans in sort of all sorts of weird ways that may not be the, the best thing. Uh, now, maybe in this case here, actually, it, actually the, it'll tell you how many buckets it generated. So it, it allocated a hash table with 
10, 24 buckets. Um, it only took one kilobyte. So maybe it just said, all right, well, my, the hash join is so small. The hash table is so small, I'll just use that. But then it clearly didn't do that for the, the, the single predicate. So one of the things we'll talk about uh, on, on Wednesday is that the, a lot of times in these optimizers, there'll be a bunch of heuristics that are baked into the optimizer that makes decisions based on some hard-coded properties or rules that somebody wrote when they built the optimizer. Um, and so there might be a rule inside of Postgres we could poke around and say, well, the number of tuples that I'm trying to join on is, is less than 100, so therefore, or, or, or greater than 1 or greater than 2, so therefore I'll u always use a hash table. Right, we can look at Postgres and see what it actually does. But the main thing I'll, I'll, I, want, I want to stress is that the optimizer is not always going to get things right. So, and often the case is the DBA has to go back and uh, uh, manually tune the, the query plan. But in addition to picking what join algorithm, what scan algorithm they want to use for computing the query, one of the things we haven't talked about is how it's going to decide what the outer relation is versus the inner relation. And doing that for two queries, for two tables is really easy. Doing that for more than two or you know, n-way joins, that's when get, things get really tricky. And this is where the commercial guys will, will outperform significantly the open source guys. Okay? All right, so that's it for today. Any questions about hashing or aggregations? All right, awesome. We'll see you guys on Wednesday, and we'll talk about uh, query optimization more. Thanks.